Welcome back, everyone. We are heading into some new territory today. We're going to discuss civilization, and basically that means we have some writing to help us understand the things we're looking at. If you'll remember from the last lecture when we discussed the Neolithic Age, we saw the combining of artistry and functionality in the form of tomb architecture, or when we looked at the houses in Chateau Hoyek and we saw that there was this blending of art and ritual when it came to funerary practices. So today, when we look at Mesopotamia, we're going to begin Mesopotamia, we will see art being used in order to reinforce the power structure in these new civilizations. So here are some of the objects we're going to look at today. And again, some of these have writing on them and we understand the writing. And so we really, we know the names of the rulers. We understand what they were trying to get across in these works of art. So there will be a little less guesswork from now on. This is not to say that we understood what they were going for exactly. It's just that we have a better idea now. So I'm going to give you kind of a quiz at the end of this lecture. And the quiz is going to be based on these four images. So I want you to be on the lookout for them and try to pay very close attention when I'm talking about them, like you always do. Between 4000 and 3000 BCE, agricultural villages evolved into larger cities, and they formed these autonomous units together, and then they incorporated the countryside around them. They developed agriculture and the ability to store surplus food, and this led to political development. Now, I used to be a middle school teacher, so I know that everybody has learned about the Fertile Crescent in the seventh grade, and that basically just signifies this area between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Mesopotamia actually means the land between the rivers. And this was the first area to domesticate grain plants. Basically, they began mass-scale agriculture, and they mastered irrigation and water management, Though they had fertile land, the area was actually resource poor. They didn't have many trees. There were no metal ores. Most of the stone that was around them was unusable. These little agricultural villages formed small political units. And these units would focus on one city. And then these were called city-states. So basically they were little tiny countries unto themselves, kind of like the Vatican. Uh, each city-state had its own government and in some cases its own gods. Organized religion was tied to governance. Religion was a major aspect of life. Each city had a particular protective deity that they petitioned for their continued success. Large architectural complexes with mixed uses in the cities, and they were religious, administrative, and they had other functions. City-states, as you can imagine, were often at war with each other, and the balance of power shifted often. Mesopotamia was prone to droughts and floods, so that would cause political upheaval as well. They didn't have stones that they could use, so most buildings were made of mud brick. The first powerful culture in this region were the Sumerians, and they had a system of religious socialism in that everything in the city-state was owned by the god of that city-state, and all people in the state worked for the god. They served as laborers, priests, soldiers, or officials. All of their product or profit was delivered to the god, and then they would receive a wage from the god. That wage was administered by priests and officials, so human beings that represented the gods on earth. The system required a lot of administration. 95% of the texts that were found in Sumer dealt with administrative organization. The Sumerians developed a writing style simultaneously with Egypt and China. This started in around 3100 BCE, and it's called cuneiform, and it's the first true written language and the first real information system. Cuneiform means wedge-shaped, so we gave it that name. The symbols evolved from pictographic to abstract phonetics, and then each symbol functions as a syllable instead of a phonetic sound. Sumerian is what's called an agglutinative language, and that means that you start with a word root, and then you create new words by gluing small meaningful parts, prefixes or suffixes, to the front or the back. 
Cuneiform evolved over time and with lots of usage. So first symbols were pictographs, and then the pictographs were turned on their sides. That happened around 2800 BCE. And then it developed into actual symbols, and that was around 2500 BCE. And as the pictographs evolved into symbols of sounds, fewer symbols were needed. Now, why in an art history class am I talking so much about language? It is because we can read this stuff and it informs our knowledge of the art that was made. So it's important that we understand the language so that we can then get a glimpse into the cultural and artistic accomplishments of these people. The first thing that we should talk about when it comes to the Sumerians are the ziggurats. The ziggurats are basically the Mesopotamian version of the pyramids, but they do not serve as tomb architecture. Ziggurats were enormous stepped structures that had a temple or shrine on top. They were religious complexes, they were city centers, they included workshops and storehouses of the city. It might have been the result of simply building upon older ruins and eventually becoming a sacred mount, similar to Chateauhoyac, where they just kept building on top of older things. Ziggurats were not built on a central axis, unlike Egyptian temples or Greek architecture. Ziggurats were built from sun-baked bricks because of their lack of stones. Outside of the most important buildings would have been made from glazed and fired bricks. We will talk about fired and glazed bricks at the end of Mesopotamia. Mud bricks disintegrate over time and basically just leave lumpy piles of earth, and so that's why these ziggurats look as they do today. In Uruk, a Sumerian city-state, there were two large temple complexes, one dedicated to Inanna, who has other names. We'll talk about her in more detail. And then one dedicated to the sky god Anu, which is called the White Temple. This is what you're looking at here. The way that they were built, they had receding tiers upon a rectangular oval or square platform. A ziggurat was a pyramidal structure with a flat top. They were often kind of covered or faced with glazed brick, like in a mosaic pattern. Sometimes the kings would have their names engraved on these glazed bricks. The tiers ranged from two to seven. There were probably shrines at the top, although there's no archeological evidence for this. They were complexes of related functions. People could visit for different purposes. So when I mentioned earlier that they were like Egyptian pyramids, I didn't mean in the way that they were used, but in the way that they were giant landmarks that had a pyramidal shape, because you would not have functions at an Egyptian pyramid. Those were just giant tombs. So I know that I said we have writing now, and so we know more, but there's still a lot of guesswork we have to do. So one of the guesses about the ziggurats is that during rituals, there would be a procession of people that would wind their way up the ziggurat, and they would make numerous turns. And the speculation is that this would increase the anticipation of the participant. It would mimic a spiritual journey. In addition to this spiritual journey, another hypothesis is that ziggurats were symbolic mountaintops. And this is reflected in the belief found in the writing that the gods resided in the mountains. So it's not that crazy to think this. Each Sumerian city-state had its own local god or owner. It also had a human ruler who was the steward of the king god, who led the people in worshiping the god. The steward slash priest was responsible for maintaining peace and the food supply by carrying out the god's orders. The local god was supposed to advocate for the city, and the god would sort of fight with the gods of the other cities, or they would help to control the forces of nature. So this is the classic, keep the gods happy so that we stay happy and fed. Inside these temples, we found statues of gods and donors, and this is possibly Inanna, which was a god of this area. The head is known as the Warka head. That possibly represents the name of the place. It's more elaborate and larger than the figures of the donors and the worshippers, and we'll look at that in a sec. And 
It actually may have been attached to a wooden body, and the reason we think that is because there are holes at the base of the neck. The head is life-sized, and it would have been inlaid with eyes and eyebrows and painted, and it possibly wore a wig made of gold. There are holes around the ears and the temples, and they believe those holes would have secured the wig. And also, if you look at the back side of this, if you turn this around, you'll see that the stone underneath is rough and unfinished, which means that there was something probably covering all that stone, which is another reason for the idea that there was a wig. In addition to the head being found in the temple, there was also this alabaster vase, which was found near the head. And it has different registers or bands of images. From the detail, you can see that it starts off on the bottom as water to crops to animals. And then it goes to men bearing offerings. And then there's this whole narrative scene at the top. And in that narrative scene, you can see Inanna's temple, and it's indicated by two bunches of reeds. And there are piles of gifts or offerings. There's a platform for sacrifices. Inanna herself is wearing a crown and has a companion. That, that You can't really see that figure. This deals with the cult procession at the time of the new year. So there would be this entire line of people waiting to offer gifts to the god and they would all ascend those stairs to the temple. Inanna takes a husband, and there is feasting, and then the heads and legs are depicted in profile, and the torsos are partially turned. This is something we will see later in Egyptian art. Be on the lookout, by the way, for a question about why you think they depicted people this way. The vase is a depiction of a rite or a ritual. Perhaps this is a symbolic marriage between a king and a goddess. And then the marriage ensures the fertility of crops, animals, and people. So this solidifies the power of the ruler by saying, I am married to the goddess. Worship me. If we all do this, then we will have crops, our animals will be healthy, and our people will be well fed. Besides paying tribute to the god and bringing offerings to the ruler, people would create these alabaster prayer statues. They would stand in for the people that they represent. This would ensure that the god is receiving constant prayer and devotion. These figures would have been stand-ins for the people they represent. They're constantly praying. They're constantly giving homage. They often have inscriptions describing what they have done for the god. It'll say something like, one who offers prayers. There are also detailed description of all the things done to honor the god in other ways. One of your lecture questions will be, what's the deal? What's the deal with the enlarged eyes? Why do you think the eyes are so big? Now, I will say that vision is an important aspect of the Sumerian religion. And you can see that the bodies on these statues remain simplified so as to not detract from the gazes. And the eyes are much more rounded than what we'll see later in Egyptian sculptures which have more sort of almond-shaped eyes. So there's something special about the eyes, and I'm going to ask you what, that, what you think that is. This is known as the bull's head lyre, and it was found in a royal tomb in Ur around 2400 BCE. It's made of gold and lapis lazuli, which is the blue. Sumerians began working in metal around 3000 BCE. The way that they made the black in the background was by using bitumen, which is a type of tar. And so you would kind of inlay precious jewels or shells or whatever into this bitumen. Here's a close-up of the scenes that are underneath the bull. And you can now see the blackness of that bitumen more clearly. The Sumerians incorporated many fantastic composite creatures. The scorpion men in this are actually mentioned in the Epic of Gilgamesh. In that poem, they talk about the journey made by the dead, and that's what this scene is kind of representing. So the inlay in this box becomes a celebration of the deceased, the owner of the box. It could be a representation of the funeral or the journey um, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, or the eventual reception of the deceased. It's most likely the man in the top panel, and he's surrounded by the human-headed bulls. And you can see on the bottom that the animals seem to be preparing for a feast. And just an interesting side note, sometimes officials and family members 
committed suicide to accompany the dead ruler into the afterlife. This occurs in other societies as well. We'll talk about this with Egypt too. The next culture to kind of take over were the Akkadians. And these were people who spoke a Semitic language, which means like Western Asia. They settled north of Uruk and Sargon I ruled from about 2230 to about 2280 BCE. He conquered most of Mesopotamia. He unified the diverse city-states. Sargon and then his grandson Naram-Sin both claimed divinity, which was different than the Sumerian system where you had local gods but then high priests. Instead, Sargon and Naram-Sin both said, no, we are the gods. They adopted cuneiform from the Sumerians. This is possibly Sargon, and this was found in Nineveh around 2200 BCE. This has facial features and hairstyle that aren't realistic, but reflect like an ideal. It's something that we'll see in this class again and again, which is there's a tension between representing the actual and then the idea of a thing. Art historians think that the damage was deliberate, and we, have, we see this in other cultures as well, where a later ruler wanted to destroy the divinity of this man. And so by destroying the sculptures, they destroyed the divinity. This is Sargon's grandson, Naram-Sin. This is called a stele, which is basically like a flat slab that would have been part of a wall, or sometimes it's like it serves as a gravestone. This is a narrative. This is telling a story. And it shows a military victory by Naram-Sin. And he's proclaiming himself divine during his lifetime. So this is not only showing his military strength, but his religious power. They needed like a new iconography to show this relationship between man and gods and how a man can be a god. And the way to do this is called hieratic or hierarchical scale. You're going to see this a lot. And, and basically it, it means that the most important person is the biggest person in the artwork. That way, if you're seeing this for the first time, you at least know, oh, the big guy must be the important one. So the figure is wearing a horned helmet, and that horned helmet is also a symbol of a god king. And further, there are these three suns that are pictured atop the mountain. That is also a symbol of divinity. And the stars are meant to represent the Assyrian god Shamash, who's watching over the battle between the Akkadians and the Lulubi people. You can see the king basically standing, trotting on his vanquished enemies. And then the, the Lulubi king, Satuni, appears standing to the right, imploring the Akkadian king to spare him. The Lulubi are also depicted as like a group that's broken ranks and they lack discipline and they are uncivilized and barbaric and that justifies the conquest. This scene can also be used to strike fear into the hearts of any rebels that wish to challenge the rule of the king. This shows that the king lacks mercy and that resistance is futile. So it's not only like a celebration of divinity, military strength, but it's also a warning to future enemies. We are powerful. Beware. After Naram-Sin, the Akkadian Empire kind of fell apart. And this was basically due to pressures from the surrounding areas. The Guti were a hill people from the northeast, and they conquered the Akkadian Empire. In addition, there were a few city-states that kind of held out from the Akkadians, and those were Gursu and Lagash. In Lagash, there was a ruler named Gudea, and he left an extensive legacy of temples and votive statues, and they had inscriptions on them, and they were made from this extremely hard stone called diorite. I have provided a video about Gudea that has a ton more information. Finally today, we're going to talk a little bit about the Babylonian Empire. It was a very short-lived empire, but it had a very famous ruler named Hammurabi. Hammurabi is famous because he created this code of laws. And then he had those laws inscribed on these kinds of pillars. And then he had these pillars distributed throughout the empire. Um, and he was the founder of the Babylonian dynasty. And Babylon was the cultural center of 
Sumer of this sort of area in Mesopotamia. This law code was a formalized system, and it had consistent application throughout all of the lands. So whatever city-state you were in, it didn't matter. You had to follow Hammurabi's law code. The law code is notable because it includes rationality, justice, and a sense of humaneness. And it can be broken down to sections that concern matters of contract, including employment and wages and liability, uh, domestic laws that govern relationships and family, and military service. It's also notable because many modern legal systems rely on a lot of these ideas. For example, presumption of innocence. It establishes that both the accuser and accused need to bring evidence to prove their case. What's kind of amazing about this is that it meant that the people were no longer subject to the whims of the ruler. Instead, there was a consistent system. The king was subject to the system. The law code is made on this massive diorite stele, which is, like I said, an extremely hard stone. And the upper part of it depicts Hammurabi receiving the code and symbols of kingship from the god Shamash. Now, the person seated is the god, Hammurabi, in his humility, I guess, is the one who's receiving while standing. And that also shows hieratic scale. If that god stood up, he would be far taller than Hammurabi. You've got hieratic scale. Shamash has a lot of symbols that tell you who he is. He has flames on his shoulders. This symbolizes his role as the sun god. And then he's offering symbols of kingship, like the measuring rod and the rope circle. And these are tools for administration or building. They're not tools for war. Okay, so we finished the lecture basically, but this is, you know, my attempt at kind of a pop quiz. So I'm going to show you a number of slides. They will have questions on them. On Canvas, you will have to answer these questions. What is this guy doing? And why do you think that's what he's doing? This guy that the arrow is pointing to is the king. What tells us that he is the king? Three reasons. Can you remember why experts think that the ziggurats are shaped in this form? We have a lot of information about Gudea. How come? <laughs>